Okay, so um, yeah, you can see my screen here. So um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what you need to start modifying and contributing to Cantera, uh, how Cantera is organized, where you can find things, and then how to make a pull request at least at a, at a high level. And Chow, maybe if you want to unmute yourself and feel feel free to jump in um, whenever you want. I know you are in the last uh, session, our last yeah session of this this track. Um, so how far did you guys get in that in that last session? Uh, so I think we we've got everyone to open a uh, pro pull request successfully. Yeah, so that, that went pretty well. Great. So. Yeah, that's great. And you just went through the slides. That was pretty much. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't I didn't do, do anything for last session. Basically, just re uh, went through all the slides and mm -hmm. uh, walk through the pro uh, the steps of. About, uh, about opening poor requests. Okay, great. Um, okay, so then let me get started with, with the software that you need to compile Cantera. So Cantera is um, at its core a C++ code. So you need a C++ compiler. There's also some C um, included in there. Um, so you need a C compiler. Uh, most C++ compilers come with a C compiler. Uh, so G++ has GCC and G++ uh, for C and C++. Clang has Clang and Clang++, um, NGW, Visual Studio. Um, uh, Visual Studio just has one, one compiler for C and C++. Um, and so the instructions for uh, various platforms, several common platforms that at least uh, us as the, the developers of Cantera have access to and test semi-regularly are um, on our website. And let me just maybe pull this open. Um, so we have the, yeah, the compilation requirements here for all your different platforms. Um, you can use Conda or Anaconda um, to do this. And actually there are compilers that come with, at least for Linux and Mac that come, that you can install with Conda that you can use to build um, Cantera, which is pretty neat. Uh, if you want to build the Python interface, you also need Python 3, um, a package called Cython, and a package called NumPy. Um, Cython converts our Python-ish code into C code, or C++ code, actually, um, which Python can load. Python can actually uh, directly load a C++ library after you compile it, provided you set it up properly. Um, and then we do rely on NumPy to handle a lot of the arrays. So you have to install those. Uh, this is the easiest to install with Conda. Um, on many platforms, Conda is the easiest way. Uh, I tend not to use Conda on my Mac nowadays. I, I use uh, PyN and uh, to install everything, which works out pretty well also. Um, OK. In terms of editing the code, right? so that's compiling the code. In terms of editing the code, um, I think most of us on the developer team have switched over to Visual Studio Code somewhat recently. Maybe, well, I switched over a few years ago. Before that, I had been using Sublime Text and Atom Editor, A-T-O-M Editor from GitHub. Um, way before that, I'd been using Notepad++. So you can use whatever you want. Um, you can even use the Visual Studio IDE. Um, Visual Studio Code is a little bit lighter weight than the Visual Studio developer environment and um, has a bunch of really cool extensions that you can install that integrate with Git and GitHub, that integrate with Python. Uh, you can do debugging for C and C++ code. Uh, it'll auto, auto, automatically format some of your code and, um, and do some of that stuff. So I would definitely recommend um, Visual Studio Code um, as something you can use if you don't have a preference already. Um, but really any text editor is going to be good enough. You could use Vim or Emacs if you're feeling Brave. Um, okay, so before I go to that, what questions do you have? I want this to be kind of interactive at least, and I'm not really going to be able to keep an eye on the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and just shout them out. Um, I, I I have a question. Do do you think we should share the link of the uh, slides in the chat? Sure. Yeah. Good. 
Oh, there we go. <laughs> Both of us did it. Um, Yeah, so that you can follow along with the slides. That's a good idea. Thanks, Joe. Okay, so um, by way of an introduction to the code, uh, we have this diagram here. And um, so let me talk through it um, layer by layer. And let's start at the top. So imagine you're a user. Uh, of Kintera, you have a Python script that uh, runs a Kintera model or a MATLAB script. Um, maybe you've linked Kintera with OpenFoam or uh, something like that. Um, and uh, let's take the example of a Python script and you're calculating ignition filter. So what happens, uh, what happens in that case? So uh, as that user Python script is running, um, import Kintera uh, imports our Python module. And I mentioned before that the Python module uses a library called Cython, C-E-Y-T-H-O-N, to um, uh, convert from something that is approximates Python into C++, which then gets compiled. Uh, so when you do that import Kintera as CT or something like that, and then do ct.solution, that is calling into the um, compiled Python module, the compiled C++ code that represents um, um, the Python functions. Within that, within the Python functions, those are all set up to call the core C++ library, okay? And so this is what allows us to have so much flexibility in terms of the interfaces we can support and the building blocks that are available is that you really only have to implement the heavy lifting functionality once in C++ at the lowest layer and maybe write a very uh, e e relatively easy wrapper around that to get it into user land, to get it to where users can start benefiting from that. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not um, um, necessarily easy to add functionality in the C++ layer down here. Um, and certainly there is some functionality that's implemented only in the Python part um, where we can take advantage of the dynamism that Python has in terms of like list generators and, and um, uh, dynamic typing and, and some of that stuff just makes uh, some things a lot easier. Um, okay, but, but in the end, that Python code is calling the C++ code at the very bottom here. And it's the same for all of the user applications here, right? Just with varying layers of indirection in between. Cantera, aside from the, um, the like thermodynamic specific or the, the uh, thermochemistry transport specific routines that we have, um, relies on a set of dependencies uh, below itself. Um, Sundials provides uh, time integrators. Gloss and LaPac do linear algebra. YAML CPP reads YAML files, uh, FMT does string formatting, and Eigen also does uh, uh, matrix algebra, matrix math. Uh, and so Kintera has a dependency on all of these other libraries. Um, uh, BLOSS or LAPAC is an optional dependency. Um, usually, so Kintera has its own that it can use uh, or it can rely on Eigen. Um, but usually if you have a BLOSS or LAPAC available for your system, that's gonna be optimized uh, for your particular system. And, and so it'll run faster than, than the default. Okay, so um, user layer calls into the wrappers, unless you're doing C++, but even with C++, there's a little bit of a wrapper there. Um, so user layer calls into the wrappers, which calls into the the C++ code. So what C++ code is there? Um, a lot. Uh, the, all of the classes that are in Kintera are listed here. Um, many of them are named uh, the way that you would expect to be, them to be named. Um, um, ideal gas constant pressure reactor implements an ideal gas constant pressure reactor. Right? so forth. Um, 
in terms of uh, hierarchy, uh, almost everything you do in Cantera is going to rely on a thermal phase or, or more likely one of its derived classes. Okay. Um, the, uh, um, so Cantera being a C++ code is object oriented. Um, object orientation is a particular programming style or programming paradigm um, that was uh, in a lot of vogue in the late 90s and early 2000s when uh, this code first started. It offers a number of, of pretty useful abstractions, um, particularly for this case where we're trying to manage the state, uh, the thermodynamic state. Um, in terms of the programming state of an object. Uh, so the temperature, for instance, is stored in a variable in the class, right? And, and you can change that variable inside the class. Um, so at its base, everything is thermal phase. And we use um, um, uh, the facility and object-oriented programming to override specific methods to implement um, specialized functionality for each of the, the derived phases. So for instance, in the ideal gas, the, uh, I mean, let's say the enthalpy is computed by the, um, well, depending on the, the species thermotype, it's, it's computed by a NASA polynomial, whereas for the Reed-Lick-Kwong equation of state, which is this class, there's a different formulation to um, um, calculate the enthalpy but they share the same implementation of, let's say, the, the uh, method to get the mole fractions, right? Which is actually implemented on the thermal phase. So you don't have, the advantage of this is that uh, both uh, an ideal gas phase and a Reed Kwong phase need to have a method that lets you retrieve the mole fractions. And you don't have to implement that on both classes because it's already been implemented on the base class, right? So this is why we use um, inheritance. Um, okay, so nearly every simulation is going to involve some sort of derived class of a thermal phase. Um, the, and this is going to do um, thermodynamic calculations for the entire phase for the mixture. Each species is going to have its thermodata uh, calculated by its interpolation type, whether that's a NASA polynomial, constant specific heat polynomial, um, NASA nine polynomial, whichever uh, polynomial you might be interested in there. Um, any simulations that involve kinetics are going to have a uh, subclass of kinetics, right? So gas kinetics, interface kinetics, perhaps a transport class. Um, if you're doing a, a homogeneous reactor, it's going to be a, a reactor or a, a one-dimensional simulation is going to be a subclass of the domain 1B, right? So these are the, the um, one, two, three, four, five, six main base classes that, that underlie almost all of Kintera's functionality, um, at least in terms of the thermochemistry part. There's a lot of other classes that you can see on this list here that implement um, other kind of uh, um, related functionality, like the AnyMap class is a C++ version of Python dictionaries, kind of, uh, and stuff like that that we use. Um, so that's really handy for uh, reading YAML files. And so we implement, or Ray, I should, shouldn't even say we, Ray implemented that. Um, okay, and then there are also uh, these factory classes, which is how these base classes actually get created when the user runs a simulation. Um, and this reaction factory over here is in italics because that's uh, an ongoing um, pull request, the ongoing work that's happening right now. Okay. Uh, okay. We, what questions do you have about that? Okay, so that's the the uh, the abstract layer of how Cantera is put together. So, what, what questions do you have about that? Hi, Brian. Uh, yeah, hi. Hi. Could you go over the directory structure as well? How things? Yeah, that's next. Yep, that's next. Okay. 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 All right, well, since that's the, the question that we got there. So all of the code is on GitHub. Um, Cantera is licensed under the BSD3 clause license, a modified version of it. There's the license. 
um, which means that some version of Cantera source code will always be open source. There are, is no possible way for all versions of this software to become closed source. Um, on the other hand, the license is, is so-called permissive, meaning that uh, anyone can take the code and do anything with it that they want, as long as they keep this, um, this uh, license notice in it, uh, as long as they meet the three conditions that are here. Uh, so um, it is perfectly possible for someone to take Kintera and offer a paid for commercial version, but they can't, number one, they can't use the Kintera trademark unless we allow them to. And number two, um, they have to, uh, include this notice, but they don't have to provide the source code. This is not a, a, a GPL type license. Um, but on the other hand, they can't stop us from, they can't stop anyone else from distributing the source code as long as they can get a copy of the source code. So uh, the nice thing about GitHub is that it has a lot of social features. Um, uh, and I don't mean that in the sense of Twitter. I mean that in terms of like um, being able to track uh, issues that come up, um, bugs and so forth. Um, and also uh, create pull requests, which is hopefully what we're going to be doing here today. Um, so the um, different folders that are here, uh, there's a folder called SRC, which is where almost all, um, well, it's where all of the C++ source files live um, with the .cpp extension. And um, um, there's a few .h files in there, but it's mostly the source files. And most of the header files live in the include slash Kintera directory. We go back to the code here. The SRC folder has the CPP code files. The include Kintera folder has the .h files. Um, I mentioned before in the uh, in this slide about the different user interfaces that we have. Python, C, uh, well, Python and MATLAB in particular, excuse me, are located in this um, interfaces folder. The uh, C interface and the Fortran interface are in the SRC folder. And so the um, interfaces Cython Cantera is the Python module. Um, we can find examples in here. We can also find the test suite. So we do run a bunch of tests uh, every time some changes get made to the code. Uh, to make sure that nothing breaks and that um, the expected functionality is retained. In that same interfaces folder, there's also a MATLAB toolbox folder, which contains the, the MATLAB code for the MATLAB toolbox. Um, the uh, samples folder has a bunch of different um, sample programs for different languages, um, uh, C++, MATLAB, and Fortran. And um, the test folder has the C++ test. So we have both Python tests and C++ tests. We want to be able to test at both layers of the, uh, of the tree, excuse me. And then in the test problems folder, these problems are um, something that we ran one time with one version of the code. They made some result. We copied that result into a CSV file and called that the truth. And, um, and so now we check that the code produces exactly the same output every time, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, it's fine as far as it goes, but um, not, uh, uh, not great because, you know, it, it, because it depends on, on uh, things like the um, particular CPU that you're running on. Right, different CPUs might have different precision or the different um, um, uh, yeah, libraries that you use. They're gonna have different precision for the numbers and excuse me, so you can end up with different results. It's been a long day. Uh, okay, and then, um, so that's the source code. Uh, sorry, this is a, a very high level overview of the source code um, repository. So. What questions do you have about that? Did, did that answer your, your questions, Teresh? Teresh, sorry. I apologize if I mis mispronounce your yeah. name. Ah, no, that's fine. Yeah, I think it's, it's clear. Thanks. Okay, good. So the, the short version is if you're looking to change C++ files, um, they're going to be in SRC or in include. 
uh, and, and or in, include, if you're looking to change Python stuff, it's gonna be interfaces, Cython, Cantera. Uh, excuse me. And if you wanna add a sample or a test, you know, we have those folders. Okay. Cantera is not just Cantera. Um, we have a website, we have Jupyter Notebook examples, we have workshop materials, we have uh, future plans. So um, I guess what I wanna point out here is we have a ton of different repositories that do a whole bunch of different things um, in our organization. So if you go to github.com um, slash Cantera, oops, slash Cantera, this is our, uh, all of our repositories that we have. Um, and it's, uh, some of them are outdated and old, uh, but in any case, this is everything that we're working on here. Uh, so if you wanna get an overview of everything that goes on, uh, this is where you can see that. And we, we really need help maintaining um, all of this stuff, right? It's not just Cantera itself, it's our website as well that breaks. Uh, I think right now, Ray just uh, maybe yesterday, last night filed, we have 15 open issues on the website, right? Because there are things that are broken or things that we can update or change. So you don't have to be an expert C++ developer or even a web developer to, to help out developing Cantera. Um, the Cantera website is uh, uh, mostly written in Python actually. So if you're pretty good at Python, then you can help out with that too. So uh, all of this stuff is, is uh, we need help with all of it, basically. Um, the other thing is that we do have this uh, enhancements repository, which is a new thing this year. And uh, so we have two kind of areas on here. One is the issues and the other is the discussions. And so um, the discussion section is when you have an idea for something that you might want to do with Cantera, uh, put it up here in discussions, because that way we can see it and we can give you some guidance on whether that's a good idea or not, whether we're already working on something like that or not. Um, and so you can see in here, Ray uh, uh, made this post about what should go into the discussions. Uh, but basically, if it's, a, uh, uh, if it's something you're thinking about that you might wanna do, put it in a discussion and, and we're happy to talk about it. If it's something that you're either already working on or you uh, have a really good idea of, of what's gonna happen or maybe it's already gone through a discussion, feel free to create an issue here on the enhancements repository and um, let us know whether it's a feature request, something you're already doing, the Google Summer of Code project idea is, is uh, only if you're a student applying for Google Summer of Code. But if you are, for instance, doing a work in progress, um, we give you a template here to fill in. Uh, so please, you know, don't ignore these fields, please fill them in and, uh, and let us know what you're doing. Um, it's really important because this is an open source project and it's not um, uh, hierarchical in any way, uh, it, we have no idea what people are doing out there with Cantera. We have no insight into that unless you come here and tell us what you're doing, right? So it's possible that we could implement a feature that breaks something that you're doing. We could uh, uh, implement the same feature, but in a different way and waste a bunch of your time. So really it's important if you're working on something to, to open a discussion, if it's kind of a, a new idea and, and an issue, if it's something you're actually working on. Um, okay. So yeah, we need uh, lots of help all over the place. Uh, if you're able and willing to help, you know, we're more than happy to help you and, and spend time coaching you and mentoring you to, to do all this. Okay. So let's, uh, let's do a little bit more action here. Okay. Let's do a little bit more action. And um, we use, uh, I think this is called the, GitHub pull request workflow. You can Google for that. I think you'll find links about it. Okay, so um, GitHub is a, a version, well, it relies on Git, which is a version control system that stores changes to text files and other files in the repository. So the Cantera slash Cantera, github.com slash Cantera slash Cantera, is the, uh, what would we call this? The source of truth, maybe. The uh, blessed version, to use a, a religious metaphor. Um, 
And uh, let's see how many people, there are four people right now that have access to uh, commit code directly to this repository. It's me and Ray, Steve DeCalloway, who's in another session right now, and uh, a professor from Louisiana State named Ingmar Schergel. Um, uh, there's nothing special about this. Uh, um, it just means that we're kind of like administrators. We've been around the longest. Um, it's not not that, that I'm a particularly good developer. I'm a, a mechanical engineer by training, right? And, and I kind of went into this software development side of things uh, almost by accident uh, ten, some 10 years ago. So it's not, um, it's not that, that Ray or, or me or Steven or, or Ingmar um, went through special training or, or anything like that. It was experience and kind of sticking around for a while, right? So committing to the project and, uh, and you can do that too. And we'd really love you, we'd really love to have you um, do that. Uh, okay, so since you can't um, commit code directly to the source of truth for the Cantera project, what you have to do instead is uh, create a fork of Cantera. And a fork is like a fork in the road, right? Just, it's, um, you can think of it kind of like an, uh, in some ways, kind of like an alternate history of Kintera, or it basically it's a place where you can have complete control over the history of your personal version of Kintera. Um, and you can do with it whatever you want. Um, you could uh, build uh, binaries and release it. You just can't call it Kintera because we have a, a trademark on that. But uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want with that. Code. Ideally, uh, when you fork Kintera, and make any changes, you will contribute it back to the source of truth in Cherry GitHub repository. Um, okay, so the way that you do that is, and feel free to open up GitHub. Uh, if you don't have a GitHub account, you'll have to sign up for one. Um, but yeah, let's 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 go through this process together uh, while we're all here. So I know, let's see, I know Gandali and Chow have a copy of Kintera already forked. Uh, is anyone who does not have a GitHub account yet and needs maybe a little extra time to sign up for one? Okay, so let me switch over here. So in the GitHub interface, let me zoom in a little bit here. In the GitHub interface, um, there's a lot going on here. This is really busy. But um, uh, once you log in and go to github.com slash Cantera slash Cantera, up here on the upper right, there's a fork button. Okay. Um, I've already forked Cantera into my personal account, but if you haven't forked Cantera yet, uh, if you clicking that button will um, uh, create a copy of this repository in your own personal GitHub account. Okay, and so that's going to be available at github.com slash your username, Brian W. Weber is my username, and then slash Cantera. Okay. And what you're going to see here is that GitHub actually keeps track of uh, the uh, forks for you. So uh, GitHub knows that I forked this repository from the upstream uh, source of truth repository here. Okay. And so if you want to see the original, you can just click that link there and it'll take you right back to the original. Okay, so now you have this copy on the internet of Cantera. That's your personal copy. You can do with it what you want. Um, however you want to handle that, it's up to you. Um, uh, like I said, you can make as many changes as you want. Uh, do whatever you want to that code. Uh, that, and that's all online. Okay. To actually make changes to the code, you need to pull the source code from the internet onto your computer. And so the copy that's on your computer is called a local repository. And this dashed line here represents a barrier. 
a network interface right between your computer and the internet and and the github up there so um uh so there's uh, a few different ways to um, uh, pull the code down onto your computer. Um, the code that's on your computer is totally private and is not shared until you choose to share it by pushing it uh, online. So you can make any changes that you want in your local copy of Cantera. You can use them, um, reuse them, whatever you wanna do. And those are all private to your computer until you push it uh, online, okay? So the workflow here, you've got a fork now, you're gonna pull down the code from your personal copy. Okay? You're gonna make some changes and commit them. You're gonna push those changes back to your personal repository. And the last step is to make, well, the second last step is to make a pull request. Now it's called a pull request because what you're saying is, hey, people in Cantera in the project, um, this is my code, here it is, please take a look at it and pull it into your project, pull it into the source of truth. Um, so it's called a pull request because you can look at it like from the source of truth repository, we are pulling your code uh, from your personal repository, okay? Through this process of the pull request, we're gonna review your code, and eventually we're gonna merge it, which will close the, the pull request and, uh, and you can move on to another feature, okay? So let's do this now all together. Um, you've got a fork, okay, great. Um, on your fork, you can get cloning instructions. So let me switch over to that. So this green button here, the, the, um, the first time you get code from GitHub or from Git onto a computer, you, do an operation called cloning. And that cloning copies the entire history of the project down onto your computer. Um, okay, so uh, uh, here's the, the URL that you need to use. So you can copy that to your clipboard and then um, open up a command prop, prompt where you have Git available to you. Okay. Let me, let me do this. So here's my terminal, uh, let me zoom it in. Um, if you're on Windows, it's gonna look similar, but the, the, mm, the commands might be a little bit different because you might be using PowerShell or maybe CMD. Uh, but in any case, um, what you can do is just type git, git clone and then paste in that URL that you copied. And then when you push enter, that is going to go to the internet, download all of Cantera source code into a folder. By default, it's called Cantera. And um, so then you need to change directory, CD, change directory into that folder called Cantera. And um, if you type LS or dir, um, LS is on Mac or Linux, dir is on Windows. Uh, it will uh, show you the files in this folder and it will show you that you've cloned all of the files from GitHub. So that's what's uh, shown here on this slide. Anyone having trouble doing that? Okay. Once you have changed into the Cantera directory, we need to add another remote. So Git refers to um, its sources of code as remotes. So right now, if you go to your repository and type git remote dash V, that's going to show you that you have one remote, which is called the origin remote, which is linked to your personal copy on uh, GitHub. Um, of course, um, the upstream copy, the source of truth copy of Cantera is going to be changing all the time as we merge pull requests from other people. And you wanna be able to um, pull in those changes to your copy 
uh, pretty frequently, or at least as often as you're working on Kintera. So we're going to add another remote that's called Upstream. Upstream is a, a pretty typical name for this. If you imagine um, the code as a river, I guess, then the Kintera slash Kintera repository is the source of the river, and your personal repository is downstream of that upstream source. Okay, so we're going to do git remote add upstream. And this now is going to be the, the source of truth version of Kintera. Okay, now we do git remote dash v again. And it shows us that we added this upstream repository um, uh, to be able to, to uh, get changes from the upstream. Okay, and um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Sue, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so I have the, those, the origin and upstream mm -hmm. the other way around because uh, I originally uh, pulled the, uh, um, like, my code from Kantara slash Kantara. So, how do I switch the, those two? Um, the easiest way to do that is to uh, um, uh, use the uh, git remote set URL which you then tell it the remote name and then the um, URL. Okay. So you can just swap the URLs there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, great question. Um, okay. So in terms of building and testing Cantera, um, uh, we have, I mentioned the site before, we have these detailed instructions about co compiling Kantera from source on our website over there. Um, after you've um, built Kantera, you can test it by running Scon's tests. You can also run a specific uh, Python test one at a time with um, this kind of magic line here. Uh, and I'm not going to do this now because it takes a few minutes to actually compile um, Kantera. Um, instead, what I want to do is walk us through the process of, um, of pushing some changes to GitHub and uh, creating a branch and then um, creating a pull request. So if we go back to the terminal with a command prompt, um, the, the um, default branch in Kintera is called main. Um, it used to be called master. Uh, about a year ago, we changed it because of um, the uh, very negative things that are associated with the word master, especially in American history. Uh, so we changed it to the name main. And this branch is the one that gets updated when um, a pull request is merged. So you never want to do any development work on, the, on your local copy of the main branch because it makes it really hard to integrate any changes um, from the upstream main branch. So you always want to um, check out a new branch uh, whenever you start working on anything in Kintera, okay? Um, uh, so the command to check out a new branch is git checkout dash b, like this. And then the name of your branch. So you can call this whatever you want. I'll call mine new branch, okay? And um, I have my terminal set up so that it's showing me what branch I'm located on. Okay. In Git, you can think of Git commits as um, uh, snapshots of the source code at particular points in time. And um, so a branch is just kind of like an alternate history of the code. Okay. If, you, if you visualize it as, uh, again, a river, Right, you can imagine the river coming in, the main branch is gonna keep going, your new branch is going to split off at some point and have its own commit added onto it. And eventually it's going to merge back with the, the main branch that has continued on. Okay. Um, so now you can uh, open up the code here in a, um, in an editor, uh, I have Visual. I happen to have Visual Studio in, uh, code in, installed, so I'll open it up in that. Um, actually, no, we don't need to do that. Anyway, 
Uh, yeah, so now you can open up your code editor and make some changes to some files here. Um, um, and when you uh, make some changes, I'm just going to, to uh, um, make a, make a, uh, a quick change here. Um, and I'm gonna, let's see here now. Okay, make that change there. Um, and if I type git diff, it's going to show me the um, differences between the uh, uh, original version and the changes that I made. Okay, so you can see I changed an open source to a closed source. Okay. If I type git status, it tells me which files have been modified or from adding new files, it tells me which uh, files are new. And now to create a commit, we can type git um, add and then the name of the file that we want to add. Okay, so that does something called staging. And staging is the step before committing. Okay, it's kind of like a holding area. And once you do the uh, once you do the commit, all of the files in the staging area are added into that commit and the staging area is cleared so you can make more changes or so you can add new files to the um, to the staging area right you don't have to commit all your files at once you can commit them in batches if it makes sense okay so i'm going to get uh, commit here if you do dash m you can type the message right here if it's a short message if you um, just do git commit, it's going to open an editor and let you type your commit message. So I'll just type test commit. Ideally, you'll have a, a, a good description of what your change is actually doing in this commit, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to keep it short. Okay, so that's going to create a commit. Now that commit is on my private local copy of Cantera. This is not, no one else can see this commit. For other people to see this commit, I have to push that branch up to um, um, my copy of Cantera. So uh, yeah, I have to uh, push it so it updates my copy of Cantera uh, in my uh, personal repository, right? Because I, I don't have access to, well, yeah. I don't have access, actually, I don't have access to push to the uh, main branch in the, the upstream repository. Uh, so what we need to do here is git push. Okay, so the command git push pushes the code from our local repository into a remote repository. And now we have to tell git which repository to look in or to push to rather. So we give the command dash u, um, which means that uh, this branch does not yet exist on my personal copy, right? This is a new branch that's not up on GitHub yet. And then we'd say the name of the remote, okay? So my personal copy, the name of my personal copy is, is origin. That's the default name for it. You can name a remote whatever you want, right? There's nothing special um, about any of the names. And I'm going to do the branch name again. Okay. So what this tells Git is push it to the origin, to a branch called new branch, and um, this is going to be a new branch, and I want to keep track of it. All right. So we do that. It pushes that up, and now um, I can open up my copy of the repository, and it tells me that. The new branch had recent pushes, and I can click here and open up a pull request now. And so what this is going to say is um, take the code that's on new branch and merge it into the main branch in Cantera. And again, we have a template here uh, of uh, in the pull request that you can fill in, that you should fill in, to um, describe the changes that you're making why you're making them, what they're doing. And then at the bottom, we have a checklist of, of things that you can run through to um, make sure that your code is ready for review. 
another thing that we really appreciate, if you do have some work in progress, you can come over here and create what's called a draft pull request. Okay, and the nice thing about draft pull requests is that it tells uh, us, the reviewers of these pull requests, that this is this code is still in motion, right? It's still a work in progress. It's not the final form of it. And so we can look at it at a high level and make sure that you're not going totally off into left field with something that we would never accept, but we don't have to necessarily do a detailed review at this point until you've finished all your changes and followed the contributing guide and, and fixed many typos and made sure everything works. Okay, and when you open a pull request, it is going to, uh, I'm not gonna actually click that button, um, but when you open a pull request, it's going to run your changes against on um, like 28 or 30 different, uh, uh, 36 different um, systems to make sure that your code, that all the tests pass, that your code meets um, the, the requirements that we have. Whew. Okay, so yeah. And oh, okay. So uh, if you make more changes and commit them to that same branch, you only have to run git push after that, you don't need to do the dash u part anymore. Okay, just get push. Okay, and then once you've uploaded it, then you can compare and pull requests and go through that process I just showed. So uh, I am out of time now. It's 5.04. I'm happy to hang around and answer any questions that you have. Um, for, an, for a couple of minutes anyways. But thank you so much all for being here today. Thank you for coming. If you were here in the morning or in our earlier sessions, thank you for coming to all of that. I really appreciate having everybody here. We had um, about 170 people register for the, the workshop today, which is just fantastic interest. And um, I really hope that, that you'll, be, you'll uh, consider becoming a contributor uh, to Cantera. And even if you don't help us maintain these, maintain everything, just uh, 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 sharing new features with the community is, is definitely appreciated and, and definitely helpful, okay? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So once you've built Cantera, and, and I have not built Cantera here, so this is not gonna work, but um, when you're still in the source directory here, you can do Python path is build Python. Um, Boyang, are you on, what platform are you on? Windows or Mac or Linux? Yeah, my pleasure, Linux and Mac. Okay, so then you can do it this way. So you, this, is, um, this will set an environment variable and then you can run Python like this. And what this will do, oops, yeah, thank you. A year and a half of remote meetings and I still haven't figured it out. Okay, so um, this part here, the Python, oops, the Python path equals build slash Python. Um, this tells Python where, the Python path environment variable tells Python where to look for Python modules. And so you're adding a directory to the default path, which is build Python. So once you've built Python, once you've built Cantera, um, there will be a directory here called build. And inside that will be a subdirectory called Python, which contains the Python interface. So you can do Python path is build Python and then Python, and then either the name of your script um, or if you just want to run interactively, you can do that. Um, you can also do that with IPython, um, which is very nice to, to test out changes uh, that you're making. Um, I, I think I can share my screen because I have my um, Cantera build. Uh, okay. Just show, yeah. Yeah, if you show uh, ct.dunder file. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, yeah, I think the screen sharing is disabled. Oh yeah, let me add that for you. There. All right. Um, can you see my terminal? So yes. I'm not sharing. Okay, yeah. Um, so if you do Python. So, so if you are under this directory, under the Cantera directory, you, and you specify your Python path, path as um, uh, by Python path equal to build. 
Python, and then you run on Python, and then here you import your um, Kutera as CT. So to make sure that you are uh, in the correct uh, Python path, you can uh, try this CT dot file. And you can check this path. If this path is uh, your build, uh, your build Python path, then that means uh, this is correct. Otherwise, it will uh, it will be maybe a Conda uh, Python path if you are using Conda uh, instead of Kutera. Uh, so, so here after you uh, run uh, as scones build, uh, it should have a directory uh, here called build here. Uh, so there's a Python. There's a Python in this directory. There, there's a Python interpreter under under this build directory. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, that's perfect. All right. What other questions do you all have? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right too. I'm so terrible with names. Uh, so the question is, is it suitable to make changes to just one of the interfaces? Um, so uh, we don't, we're not super sticklers about that. Uh, if you only implement something in, in C++, it's actually relatively easy to add it to the Python interface at that point. Um, uh, and, and we don't worry too much about the MATLAB interface, <laughs> which is why it's kind of fallen behind. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's, we're more interested in having the things than, than I think, than in uh, being extreme about you know, those kind of requirements. So, yeah. Um, and if it's a new feature that goes into Python only, then you know it should it should be really taking advantage of of that dynamic nature of Python. Like for instance, the one D flame solver, the auto um, auto version of the one D flame solver, the auto logic is implemented in Python. Uh, so it's only available in the Python interface uh, because that's just that kind of like conditional checking and is the grid big enough and that kind of stuff was just much easier in Python dynamic typing than in C++. So I don't know if that answered your question, but what other questions are out there? Okay, well, I guess then in that case, I'm going to end, uh, end the meeting here. Um, of course, we have our Google group where we also take questions about development. So uh, anything that wasn't clear from today, uh, please let me know, or please post on the on the Google group there. If you do happen to go through those compiling instructions and you find um, things that aren't clear or that are broken, um, again, please let us know, because uh, we, me and Ray and and even and Chow, uh, Chow is relatively new, but still not that new. Uh, you only get a chance to be new once. You only get a chance to go through something for the first time once. So. Uh, that was long in the past for us, so we don't necessarily see our blind spots. So please let us know any improvements we can make there as well. Um, thanks, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon, evening, morning, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, and I'll see you around the community, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Yep, thank you.